Good morning, my name is Professor Loesch, and today we are going to be discussing Chapter 4, The Biological Basis for Understanding Pharmacology. As a psychiatric nurse, you have to have a basic understanding of how that brain works and what the current theories are regarding mental illness. Today we'll be talking about medications that are used to treat mental illness, a concept known as psychopharmacology and it's related to those theories. The medications that we use in psychopharmacology directly affect the central nervous system, also the client's behavior, perceptions, thinking, and emotions. These drugs used to treat mental disturbances can provide symptom relief, but they can also interfere with other activities of the brain. Psychiatric illness itself is caused by a multitude of factors. This can include things like genetics, neurodevelopmental issues, drugs, infection, and our response to some trauma or some abnormal experience that we've seen. Psychiatric illness results in an alteration in neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are the chemical messages that are sent back and forth between the neurons in the brain. Remember, we talked about the neurons in the body in the introductory chapter and how they affect the brain. They're the little workhorses of that brain and they send the messages and control different activities. Those neurotransmitters can either inhibit actions in the body or stimulate actions in the brain. It will affect the body, but they stimulate the actions in the brain and that can affect the body. What kind of actions? Things like rest, things like digestion, things like increased levels of consciousness, and these are all controlled by those neurotransmitters. Depression, anxiety, all a result when those neurotransmitters aren't functioning correctly. So we could either have not enough neurotransmitters available or too many neurotransmitters available. And so those alterations in those neurotransmitters in the transmission of those chemical messages are the targets of our psychotropic drugs. So the central nervous system comprises the brain, the spinal cord, and any nerves associated that control different voluntary acts in the body. Structurally, that brain consists of the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brain stem, and the limbic system. There are eight major brain functions. The brain monitors changes in the external world, it monitors the composition of body fluids. It, help regulates, re, it helps regulate contractions of the skeletal muscles, regulate our organs, initiate and regulate certain basic drives such as hunger, thirst, sex, aggression, self-protection. It helps to maintain our conscious sensation, store and get memories, regulate our moods and emotions, regulate sleep, language, and process certain auditory functions. The cerebrum is divided into two hemispheres and four lobes. Most of the lobes and structures are found in both halves with the exception of the pineal gland and that's located between those two hemispheres and that's an endocrine gland. The left hemisphere will control the right side of the body and it's the center for logical reasoning and analytic thoughts like reading, writing, mathematical tasks. The right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and it's responsible for creative thinking, intuition, and our artistic abilities. Those cerebral hemispheres are divided into the four lobes, the frontal, the parietal, then the temporal, and the occipital.
some functions of the lobes are distinct and others are integrated. So the frontal lobes will control organization of thought, body movement, memories, emotions, and moral behavior. Integration of that information would regulate arousal, focus our attention, and enable us to engage in problem solving and decision making skills. Abnormalities in those areas of the frontal lobe are associated with things like schizophrenia, ADHD, and dementia. The parietal lobes would interpret different sensations of touch and help us with things like spatial orientation. The temporal lobes are our centers for our senses, things like smell, hearing, also for memory and emotional expression. The occipital lobes help coordinate our language generation, our visual interpretations, and our depth perception. The cerebellum is located just below the cerebrum and it's our center for coordination of movements, postural adjustments. It helps receive and integrate different information from different areas of the body like the muscles, the joints, the organs, and other parts of the central nervous system. Research shows that when we don't produce enough dopamine, then we will have uncoordinated muscle movement. And we see this in certain diseases like Parkinson's or dementia. The brain stem includes the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, the obliglotta, and it's also our center for cranial nerves three through 12. The medulla is located just above the spinal cord and it has the vital centers for our respirations and our cardiac function. Right above the medulla in front of that cerebrum is the pons, which bridges the gap structurally and functionally. And it is our motor pathway. The midbrain connects the pons, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. And it includes most of the reticular activating system and our EPS or extra paramedial system. The reticular activating system controls motor activity, sleep, our level of consciousness, and our level of awareness. And the extra pyramidal system helps send information to the body regarding movement, coordination, so it goes from the, sprint, from the brain to the spinal nerves. And then we have a part of the brain called the locus corulus, and this is a group of norepinephrine producing neurons in the brain and it's associated with things like stress, anxiety, and impulsive behavior. We also have the limbic system. This is located just above the brain stem and that would include things like the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The thalamus helps regulate activity like sensations and emotions. The hypothalamus helps regulate temperature, appetite control, endocrine function, sex drive, and certain impulsive behaviors that are associated with feelings of anger, rage, or excitement. The hippocampus and the amygdala are involved in our emotional arousal and memory. When we have disturbances in the limbic system, we see certain types of mental illness. And we also see memory loss that would accompany dementia and poorly controlled emotions, such as those that we see when someone's exhibiting some sort of psychotic or manic behavior. So this slide shows different parts of the brain and how those different parts affect those areas of the brain, which part is responsible for what. So the frontal lobe, again, it's responsible for that executive function. And you'll see some of the things are reasoning, thinking, planning, your parietal lobe, which helps us control uh, things like sensation, hearing, your occipital lobe, which controls things like vision, your cerebellum, which would control things like coordination, balance, uh, your brain stem, that's going to control things like breathing, temperature, heart rate, and then your temporal.
and that helps with memory, emotions, understanding different languages. Here we have another image that shows us the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. You should know these areas and what they're responsible for. So the midbrain is responsible for pupil pupillary reflexes and eye movement. The pons helps process the station and the auditory pathways. The medulla oblongata will help control balance, heart rate, rate, depth of respirations, cough, swallowing, sneezing. Those are those protective functions of the body, maintenance of the blood pressure and vomiting, and then the cerebellum bellum is going to help coordinate that skeletal muscle, coordination, contractions, and equilibrium. When the brain is genetically programmed, something called plasticity occurs, and that can happen throughout life. That's the ability of the brain to change and adapt to new information. Plasticity is a process of adapting and changing as the gray matter shrinks and thickens and connections are made. The connections between the neurons can change with different mental illnesses or with the use of psychotropic medications. Neuroplasticity or brain plasticity is the ability of the nervous system to change its activity in response to some intrinsic or extrinsic stimuli by reorganizing the structure, function, or connection. Functions of the brain include things like maintaining homostasis, regulating the autonomic nervous system, controlling our biological drives and behaviors, controlling the cycle of sleep and wake, this, controlling our circadian rhythms, controlling our conscious mental activity, our memory, and our social behaviors. It does this through a process of intracranial regulation, and that would include our normal and abnormal processes of the intracranial function. When we care for people experiencing brain issues, a lot of times they'll have a problem with their intracranial regulation. We can care for these clients in both the community and the inpatient setting. Intracranial regulation would depend on a constant blood supply, delivering oxygen and nutrients with carbohydrates, carbohydrates as the main source of fuel to the brain. Any alteration in those processes could cause a mental disturbance or some sort of physical symptoms. Agents that we use to treat mental illness can cause a variety of undesired effects like sedation or excitement, different motor disturbances, sexual dysfunction, and weight gain. So it's difficult to develop new drugs that are effective, safe, and well tolerated without the client experiencing some of those side effects. So you should be aware of the types of imaging that we use in order to understand different abnormalities of the brain. One of them that we use is a PET and the other one is a SPECT scan. And these are more advanced imaging techniques and they're able to examine the function of the brain. Radioactive substances are injected into the blood and then the flow of that substance goes into the brain and it's monitored as the client does certain cognitive activities as instructed by the person that's administering the test. The PET would use two photons simultaneously while the SPEC scan uses just one single photon. The PET scan provides better resolution with a sharper, clearer picture, and it usually takes about two to three hours, whereas the SPEC scan only takes about one to two hours. They're both used for research and not for diagnosis or treatment of clients that have a mental disorder. There was a recent breakthrough in being able to use the PET scan to identify the amyloid plaques and tangles of someone with Alzheimer's. Uh, originally, these conditions could only be diagnosed through an autopsy, but now we use a chemical marker known as FDDNP with the PET scan to help identify the amyloid plaques and the tangles. 
The amyloid PET scan actually measures the buildup of abnormal amyloid protein in the brain, which is one of the key hallmarks of Alzheimer's. This FDG PET scan measures the concentration of glucose in the brain and tells how the brain is using that energy. The scans also show how the brain's working, which can't be seen in any other way. In clients that have Alzheimer's disease, we would typically see a decrease in the glucose close metabolism in the brain and a decrease in the cerebral blood flow. We also might see in clients with schizophrenia, a decrease in the cerebral blood flow. Because we do use radioactive substances, it does limit the amount of times that a person can undergo this test. You also have to consider certain risk factors like allergies to the actual contrast. Uh, some clients might think it's scary to get that radioactive substance, so they might not want to do it. The imaging equipment itself is very expensive. Some people can't do the procedure because of fear or claustrophobia. And remember, that could be enhanced by the mental illness itself. And then research is finding that a lot of the changes in disorders such as schizophrenia uh, at the molecular and chemical levels cannot be detected with those current imaging techniques. So now you know that evidence-based neuroimaging looks at the brain. Once again, the PET scan looks at blood flow to the vascular area. So it's looking for an increase in the blood flow that would accompany neuroactivity. The PET scan can provide evidence of decreased metabolism in unmedicated clients with depression or schizophrenia and increased metabolism in clients with OCD. The SPEC scan, both PET and SPEC, use radiation to look at local brain regions that are associated with the perceptual, cognitive, emotional function, and behavioral functions. Both PET and SPEC can show uh, dysregulations in the system resulting in things like schizophrenia and loss of monomines in depression. Now monomines are things like those neurotransmitters we were talking about earlier and we'll go more into that depth on that as we progress through these slides. Functional MRI, this would measure how two regions of the brain communicate with each other and it helps predict how the client will respond to certain antipsychotics. With the functional MRI, we see patients that are just suffering from uh, schizophrenia will show differences in the striatal functional connectivity. The striatal connectivity index will be able to predict, predict which of those clients will be able to respond to meds and who won't. So we're able to use this test to see if we give them a certain medication, would it be effective? This is image 44 from your textbook and it's a PET scan and it's showing the increased metabolism in the brighter colors. Uh, that it's going to happen in that frontal cortex. This is a patient with OCD and when we compare it against someone who has normal control. This suggests that there is some sort of altered brain function in OCD and the PET scan will show the normal control on the left and the OCD on the right. Neuroimaging looks at the brain for structure and functioning. Structural brain imaging techniques show gross anatomical details of the brain structure and would include a CT, which produces slices or a 3D image and it shows gray matter reductions ventricle abnormalities, and people that have schizophrenia. The MRI uses a magnetic field to produce a cross-sectional image, and it would show gray matter reduction, ventricle abnormalities, and schizophrenia. We also have functional brain imaging techniques, and they show activity of the brain. So that would be the PET scan. Again, we're putting that radioactive substance in there, it travels to the brain, and it shows up on the scan as a bright spot, or it produces images of the activity and a 3D visual of the central nervous system, and it can help us detect schizophrenia. 
It also is able to show us any decreases in metabolic activity in those frontal lobes, any sort of dopamine dysregulation, any sort of blockage of the dopamine receptors when we use those antipsychotic meds. Uh, it helps us see certain images that are associated with depression. It helps us to determine if serotonin is being blocked and it will tell us if those antidepressant medications will work based on those images. It also helps us look at images of things associated with Alzheimer's and any reduction in the availability of the nicotine receptors. The single PETS scan or the SPECT scan is similar to the PET, but it uses something called Y radiation photons. It doesn't cost as much money. The, regula the resolution of it is not as good as the PET scan. Most psychotropic drugs will produce effects by altering the availability of the dopamine, the acetylcholine, the norepinephrine, the serotonin, the histamine, the GABA, or the glutamate. The receptor antagonist will block neurotransmitter activity or agonist will promote neurotransmitter activity. So the brain itself has more than 100 billion of these interconnected nerve, cell, nerve cells called neurons and supporting cells. And the brain functions are carried out by those neurons. They are the functional units of the brain and the nervous system, and they're responsible for receiving the sensory input from the outside world and then sending those motor commands out to our muscles for transforming and relaying the electrical signals at every step in between. There's more than 100 billion of these nerve cells or neurons and supporting cells. An essential feature of these neurons is the ability to initiate signals and conduct electrical impulses from one end of the cell to the other, something called neurotransmission. So these electrical signals within the neurons are converted at the synapses into chemical signals through the release of molecule, molecules called neurotransmitters, and then they send that electric signal to the other side of the synapse. It's not surprising that mental illness is often associated with alterations in some of these brain functions. The electrical signals in the neurons are converted at the synapses into the chemical signals through the release of molecules called neurotransmitters. When the electrical signal is sent on the other side of the synapse, once that electrical impulse reaches the end of the neuron, the neurotransmitter is then released from that axon terminal at the presynaptic neuron, and it will move across that synapse to a postsynaptic neuron. It will attach to the specialized receptors on the surface of that neuron, and it will either inhibit or excite some activity at the postsynaptic neuron. The activities of neuron are shown here in the image. So as you see, it moves from one neuron to the other by the use of those receptors, those neurotransmitters, a process called conduction. Conduction along the neuron involves the inward movement of the sodium ions followed by the outward movement of the potassium ions. And when the current reaches the end of the cell, the neurotransmitter is released. That transmitter would then cross the synapsis and attach to the receptor on the postsynaptic cell. The attachment of the transmitter to the receptor would either in stimulate or inhibit the activity of that postsynaptic cell. Sometimes uh, there's an insufficient uh, type of transmission that can be caused by not having enough neurotransmitters released from the presynaptic cell or by a decrease in the available receptors. So when that happens, the person's not going to have enough of something available. 
Maybe they don't have enough norepinephrine. Maybe they don't have enough serotonin. Or maybe they have too much dopamine. Something like too much dopamine can be caused by excessive transmission. And it's caused by excessive releases of that transmitter or increased receptor responses. So this would happen in something like schizophrenia. After they attach to the receptor and in, exert the influence on that postsynaptic cell, the neurotransmitter would separate from the receptor and then be destroyed. So immediate inactivation of the neurotransmitter would occur at the postsynaptic membrane. Another way that the neurotransmitter could be destroyed is once it interacts with the postsynaptic receptor, it would be released and then taken back up into the presynaptic cell. This action is called reuptake of the neurotransmitter. All activities of the brain would involve neurons, neurotransmitters, and receptors, and their targets of pharmacological intervention. Most psychotropic drugs act by either increasing or decreasing the activity of certain neurotransmitters. Thought disorders such as schizophrenia are physiologically associated with excess transmission of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It controls complex movements, motivation, cognition, and helps regulate our emotional responses. It comes from something called tyrosine, an amino acid in our diet. We'll see changes in dopamine levels in things like schizophrenia and psychosis and also Parkinson's. Antipsychotic medications help block dopamine receptors and reduce dopamine activity. We'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about the medications. Norepinephrine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It can help with changes in our level of attention, learning, memory, sleep, wakefulness, and mood. It's located in the brain stem. There is a derivative of norepinephrine called epinephrine, and it is also an excitatory neurotransmitter that helps control our fight or flight response. So norepinephrine is also called noradrenaline, and epinephrine is called adrenaline. Excessive norepinephrine is associated with things like anxiety disorders. So too much can lead to anxiety, not enough can contribute to things like memory loss, social withdrawal, and depression. Antidepressants help block the reuptake of the norepinephrine, and that makes it more available in the body. MAO inhibitors can help inhibit the norepinephrine by inhibiting or metabolizing MAO. And then epinephrine has a limited distribution in the brain but it does control that fight or flight response in our peripheral nervous system. Serotonin is an inhibitory neuron for the most part. It comes from something called tryptophan, which is another dietary amino acid. Serotonin helps with controlling our food intake, our sleep and wakefulness, regulating our temperature, controlling pain, controlling sexual behavior, regulating our emotions. Elevated levels are seen in clients with anxiety, mood disorders, and schizophrenia, and it can contribute to things like delusions, hallucinations, and withdrawn behavior. Some antidepressants block serotonin, making it more available in the synapse. So we use this in clients with depression because serotonin is one of those neurotransmitters that is low in someone with depression. So if we can make the serotonin more available, then it will help improve the mood. Histamine is what we call a neuro 
modulator. It controls alertness, gastric secretions, cardiac stimulation, and our peripheral allergic responses. It's still being investigated as to how it affects us regarding mental illness. Some of the psychotropic drugs will block the histamine, and that causes things like weight gain, sedation, and low blood pressure. Acetylcholine can be excitatory or inhibitory, and it helps control sleep, our wakefulness, our uh, muscles to become alert. It's found in the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, especially near the junction of skeletal muscle. It comes from dietary choline found in things like red meat and vegetables. Studies show that people with Alzheimer's have decreased levels of acetylcholine secreting neurons. And people with myasthenia gravis have reduced acetylcholine receptors. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It can have neurotoxic effects if we have too much of it in the body. It has been um, known or associated with things like brain damage, especially brain damage caused by strokes, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, ischemia, and some other degenerative diseases like Huntington's or Alzheimer's. We have the uh, neuropeptides or the neuromodulators. We'll talk a little bit more about those. Those enhance or prolong or inhibit or limit the effects of certain neurotransmitters. And then um, the GABA, that is a amino acid and it's a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. When we don't have enough GABA, what we see is things like anxiety. So uh, we need GABA in the brain. We may increase GABA in people by the use of things call, called benzodiazepines to help treat things like anxiety and help people sleep. So whenever we have increases in dopamine, we'll see things like schizophrenia and mania. With decreases, we'll see things like Parkinson's or depression. With norepinephrine, increases would be seen with things like mania, anxiety, and schizophrenia, and decreases would be associated with depression. With serotonin, decreases are associated with depression, and increases are associated with anxiety. And then histamine decreases are associated with sedation and weight gain. With GABA, decreases are associated with mania, anxiety, and schizophrenia. And increases are associated with reduction of anxiety. So we get that a lot of times from those benzodiazepines we just talked about. And then with glutamate, we'll see decreases in the NMDA receptors and that can lead to things like psychosis and increases in NMDA receptors we would see with clients that have neurotoxicity, neurodegeneration, and Alzheimer's disease. And increases in the AMPA receptors we would see improved cognition performance and behavioral tasks. So this might be when we give certain medications that slow the rate of uh, progression with the Alzheimer's. And then we have uh, acetylcholine, and with increases of acetylcholine levels, we would see things like depression, and decreases of acetylcholine are seen in Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Korea, and Parkinson's disease. These are those uh, peptides, those neuromodulators we just talked about, so those are things like substance P, somatostatin, and neurotensin. So with substance P, this helps regulate mood and anxiety, and it also plays a role in pain management. Somatostatin, we'll see decreases of this in Alzheimer's, 
decreased levels of SRIF in spinal fluid of some of the depressed patients and then increases in things like Huntington Korea. And then neurotensin will see decreased levels in the spinal fluid of clients who have schizophrenia. Uh, for the client with a mental health issue, medication management is going to be extremely important. So now we're going to talk about some of those drugs and how we care for the patient. So antidepressants like your MAOI inhibitors, your TCAs, your SSRIs, your SNRIs. We'll be talking about anxiety agents like buspirone or benzodiazepines. We'll be talking about mood stabilizers like lithium. Uh, sedative hyp hyp hypnotics or barbiturates, antipsychotic agents, um, both first generation and second generation, and then those anticholinesterase drugs, which we mainly use for things like Alzheimer's. You also have to understand how the drug works, the side effects, the contraindications, the interactions, and what interventions we would use to help these clients manage. Efficacy of the drug refers to the maximum therapeutic effect that the drug can, drug can achieve. Potency is the amount of drug that we need to achieve the maximum effect. Low potency drugs will require a higher dose to get that full efficacy. Higher potency drugs will require a lower dose. And then we also look at the half-life time, and that's the amount of time that it takes from the blood uh, drug to be removed. From that bloodstream you should also be you should also be aware of the black black box warnings that are associated with these drugs some things that you want to give consideration to regarding medications that are used to treat different psychiatric orders are the following Medications are selected on its ability to target certain symptoms in a client, like delusional thinking, panic attacks, or hallucinations. So the effectiveness is evaluated based on its ability to either diminish, diminish or eliminate those symptoms. A lot of the psychotropic drugs are given in adequate doses for some time before the full effects are actually realized. So, for example, tricyclic antidepressants often take four to six weeks before the client would experience any sort of therapeutic benefit. The dose of the medication is often set at the lowest effective dose. Sometimes the client might need a higher dose in order to stabilize their symptoms. Lower doses are often used to sustain those effects over time. Older adults typically require lower doses of the medication to experience a therapeutic effect. It also could take the drug longer to achieve its full therapeutic effect in the older adult. Psychotropic meds are often decreased slowly, tapered off, and not stopped abruptly. And this is because of potential problems with rebound symptoms recurrence of the original symptoms or withdrawal from discontinua discontinuation of the drug. Follow-up care is required and essential to ensure compliance with the medications, to make needed adjustments, and to manage those side effects. Compliance is often enhanced when the regimen is simple in both terms of the number of medications prescribed and the number of daily doses. Antidepressants are used to treat major depressive illnesses, anxiety disorders, the depressed phase of the bipolar disorder, and psychotic depression. There are also some off-label uses for antidepressants, and that would include things like chronic pain, migraines, uh, different types of diabetic or peripheral neuropathies, sleep apnea, some dermatological disorders, panic disorders, and eating disorders. 
The antidepressants are divided into four groups, the tricyclic and related cyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, MAO inhibitors. And then we have some other uh, antidepressants, and we'll talk about those as well. Monoamines include neurotransmitters that are then further divided into subgroups, such as catecholamines like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine, and dolamine, such as serotonin, and then drugs and food substances. So as we talked about earlier, uh, things that a lot of these foods or a lot of these uh, neurotransmitters come from foods like the... Um, amino acids so amino acids that we take in through our dietary resources are will lead to production of these monoamines now to understand maois we have to understand a couple things okay we looked at the previous slide and we learned that maos are divided into those subgroups Okay, the MAO is an enzyme that destroys monoamines. So MAOIs are drugs that increase the concentration of the monoamines by preventing the MAO from destroying the monoamines. So it makes them more available. Okay, so the MAOs will block the enzyme that metabolizes the monoamines and that helps increase levels of things like serotonin and norepinephrine, and it's used in something called intractable depression. The SSRIs and the SNRIs are more commonly used, though, because of other effects that occur with the MAOIs, and that is um, the vasopressor effect, okay, the risk for the um, hypertensive crisis, which is the most concerning thing that can happen with this drug. So examples of MAO inhibitors include phenylzine or Nardil, tranylcypromine or Parnate, and NSAM or Celagiline. And they're delivered as the MAO inhibitor through the skin like a patch. The most feared vasopressor effect is a hypertensive crisis that can result if the client were to take some over-the-counter uh, medication and those medications would contain things like pseudoephedrine or if they were to somehow take in tyramine which is commonly found in certain foods aged foods fermented foods and certain beverages Because of the risks for this hypertensive crisis that can occur with the client if they take this MAOI inhibitor and they ingest pseudoephedrine or tyramine in any form, we have to do strict educational teaching to make sure that the client understands that they can't consume some of the foods that are seen on this slide. All right, beer, wine, aged cheese, organ meats, avocados. And there's a multitude of other foods. Um, also, cold medications. Those are medications that often contain that pseudoephedrine, especially when people, you know, have that stuffy nose and they can't breathe well. Dietary restriction of the tyramine also has to be continued for at least two weeks after we stop the MAOIs until that uh, enzyme that we've been inhibiting starts to go back to its normal level of functioning so for that reason we're going to re go ahead and restrict that tyramine for at least two weeks after we stop the maoi also uh, you can't take these drugs with other antidepressants like ssris so we have to stop one before we start the other and usually there's a two-week washout period for all of that so we taper it down we stop one and then we start the other after two weeks. Because we don't fully understand how these psych psychotropic drugs work, 
we have to be very careful and sometimes that can make drug interactions very challenging. The drug interactions can also mod modify or alter their effect on how that drug works on the body. When it comes to pharmacokinetic interactions, this can happen when one drug alters the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, or the elimination of another, and that will affect the way the drug works in the body. Most pharmacokinetic interactions result from either an inhibition or an induction of cytochrome P450. So let's talk about what P CYP450 is. Cytochrome CYP450 enzymes are found in the liver and other cells throughout the body. They, they play a huge role in things that are in metabolism of things that are foreign to the body. So that includes drugs. And because of the effects on drug metabolism, this CYP450 enzyme is also associated with detoxification. The usual form of drugs that enter the body, the body is not able to clear from the body to, to rid itself of it. So this CYP450 helps with this. It does this by converting the drug into a form that can be excreted from the body. It does, it does this through two methods. Phase one, known as oxidation, or through another process, phase two, known as con con conjugation. In a nutshell, both phases help to excrete the drug from the body. So now we're talking about the effects of pharmacodynamic interactions and polypharmacy. If I'm not careful when I give a client two different drugs, they can act together at the same time and that can result in what we call a synergistic or antagonist effect. Now we were just talking about this with something called CYP or crita cytochrome P450 enzymes. These enzymes are found in the liver and they affect drug metabolism. And how they do that is we have what we call CYP450 inducers and CYP450 inhibitors. The CYP450 inducers and inhibitors both either increase or decrease how the drugs work. So remember, these drugs are in the liver and they're helping convert the drug into a form that can be excreted by the body. So let's say, for instance, our client is on an SSRI, a serotonin, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. When we take these drugs, we have to be careful because if we induce too much, they increase serotonin in the body. And if we induce too much serotonin, it can cause the person to be aggressive, anxious, or even manic. So now uh, we have these drugs called enzyme inducers. And what they do is they increase the CYP450 enzymes and increase the metabolism of those enzymes, of that drug. So some of these are phenytoin, rifampin, and St. John's wort. So if my client were on an SSRI and I were to give him something like St. John's wort, it could increase the metabolism of the SSRI. And that could result in that client developing a serotonin syndrome, which is a dangerous side effect of the drug and can actually result in death if we're not careful. Sometimes we also can give something called an enzyme inhibitor. An enzyme inhibitor would be known as grapefruit juice, protease inhibitors, or azoles. So these would inhibit the production 
or the metabolism of the CYP450. So if we were giving this with a drug, it could inhibit or cause an antagonistic effect of that drug. So it may slow down the way the drug works. The drug may not work the way it's supposed to. We also have to be careful with polypharmacy because when we give multiple different types of drugs, and this can happen if someone has you know, a condition like diabetes or some other complication, and they also have a psychiatric disorder, we want to make sure that the drugs mix and match and go together. We have to be especially careful with the elderly population when we're talking about mixing and matching of drugs. There are a few theories that account for the use of antidepressants, and that's what we're going to be talking about. This slide here is talking about MAOIs, which is a type of antidepressant. If we look at the theories, one of the theories says that lack of three monoamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, or serotonin, lead to depression but there's no clear evidence that this happens there is another theory that states that low levels of neurotransmitters cause an increase in the uptake of the receptor sensitivity over time and that's why it takes several weeks for patients to feel better when they're taking these antidepressants And then a more recent theory is a downstream molecular event theory that the receptors trigger the regulation of the genes. So they believe that the gene for the brain derived neurotropic factor is repressed in depression and that that can be activated by the antidepressant drugs themselves. So First, we're going to talk a little bit about the MAOI inhibitors, what they are, and how they work. So your main MAOIs are serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. And they're broken into a couple of classes. Okay, so they're called catecholamines or indolamines. The MAOs are an enzyme that destroys these monamines, the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, the dopamine, and the serotonin. So MAOI inhibitors increase the concentration of the monamines by inhibiting the action of that MAO. So if the MAO isn't present, it can't destroy the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, the dopamine, or the serotonin, and therefore, when we give an MAOI inhibitor, the serotonin, the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, and the dopamine will all become more available. These drugs are not usually our first drug of choice, and one of the reasons is because it does affect so many neurotransmitters, but we would use it in people that have severe depression and people that are suicidal. One of the problems is uh, it blocks that enzyme that metabolizes, that metabolizes the monoamines. So again, it blocks um, that enzyme that would normally break down the serotonin and the norepinephrine in specific. That's what we're trying to do. And then it makes those things more available for somebody that's depressed to increase their mood or make them feel better. The problem is it has um, a vasopressor effect called a hypertensive crisis. So if the client takes anything over the counter, like for a cold, or if they were sick that contained pseudoephedrine or adrenergic monoamine tyramine, which is found in things like aged or fermented foods or beers or certain types of beverages, then they can become extremely ill with this hypertensive crisis. So we have to make sure that the client understands that they can't eat foods that contain tyramine. And even when they stop this drug, they have to wait for at least two weeks before they can eat anything with 
the tyramine in it until the body goes back to its original process. We also wouldn't mix this with other antidepressants, especially like your SSRIs, because your SSRIs allow more serotonin to be available. So the combination of the serotonin from this drug and the other serotonin should could create a life-threatening uh, condition called serotonin syndrome as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the other antidepressants. So to prevent this hypertensive crisis, you're going to teach the client to avoid those foods. And there is a chart in your book that lists the different foods that the client can and can't have. All right. And the over-the-counter medications that have this pseudoephedrine or the adrenergic monoamine tyramine, which is found in certain foods and possibly certain uh, supplements. So the next antidepressant we're talking about are the SSRIs. These are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and they prevent the reuptake of serotonin. This allows the serotonin to stay in the synapse longer, making it more available to the brain and the body. Examples include fluoxetine or Prozac, sertraline or Zoloft, paroxetine or Paxil, Cytolopram or Celexa, and Cytolopram or Lexapro. There's also a combination drug called Vilazidone, which helps by um, providing partial agonist activity. So what it does is it also blocks the negative feedback to allow more serotonin to be available and also increase the release of more serotonin. These drugs have fewer side effects, including less anticholinergic effects than the tricyclic agents. And this is really due to the fact that it affects less neurotransmitters. However, if we take too much, we can see anxiety, insomnia, sexual dysfunction, and GI disturbances in the patient. They also can develop uh, serotonin toxicity, especially if we take other drugs that have serotonin in them, those MAOI inhibitors, SNRIs, things like lithium, tryptin, buspirone, tramadol, over-the-counter cold medications that have dextromethorphan or antidopaminergic drugs like xanazine or tetrabenazine. We also have to be careful with this with any antipsychotics, whether they be first or second generation. Increased risk of serotonin toxicity is generally caused by those pharmacokinetic interactions that we talked about earlier with the CYP450. <clears throat> Adverse events can also happen if we suddenly discontinue the medication and the person can develop something called discontinuation syndrome. That's more likely with a SSRI or an SNRI. So for serotonin syndrome, in order to avoid confusing it with neuromalignant syndrome or anticholinergic toxicity, remember the acronym SHIVERS. And then you can easily re recognize the signs and symptoms of the serotonin syndrome. So that would be shivering, which is a neuromuscular symptom that is unique to serotonin syndrome. Hyperreflexia and myoclonus. This is seen in mild to moderate cases and it's most likely to be seen in the lower extremity. Someone with neuromalignant syndrome would have more of rigidity, similar to that of a pipe, really strong rigidity. Increased temperature is not always present, but it is observed in severe cases. Vital sign abnormalities such as tachycardia, tachypnea, and a blood pressure that's all over the place. Encephalopathy, 
mental status changes such as agitation, delirium, and confusion, restlessness due to the excess serotonin activity, sweating, which is an autonomic response to that excess serotonin, and that can help differentiate from anticholinergic toxicity where the patient would present with a hot, dry touch. Once the serotonin syndrome is identified, it's important to continue any serotoninergic agent. Provide supportive care with fluids, sedate with benzodiazepines. That would help decrease the myoclonic jerks and also helps with temperature control. If the client is hyperthermic, they might require intensive cooling. A potent antihistamine and a serotonin antagonist may also be administered. Discontinuation syndrome can occur in the client after abrupt discontinuation of an antidepressant that was taken for at least six weeks. Symptoms include flu-like symptoms, insomnia, nausea, imbalance, sensory, sensory disturbances, and hyperarousal. They're usually mild and they last for one to two weeks. They're usually extinguished with reinstitution of the medication. Okay, SNRIs, these are your serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and they block the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. But it is controversial about the dual action of them and their effects. So those would be things like venolfaxine or Effexor, duloxetine, and Pristique or desvenolfaxine. And these tend to have uh, better effects than just the SSRI itself, and that's possibly because it would increase both serotonin and norepinephrine. And then we have the SN. DIs, these are the serotonin norepinephrine disinhibitors, and this is mirtazapine or Remron, and this increases norepinephrine and serotonin by blocking the presynaptic noradrenergic receptors. The mirtazapine is often combined with an SSRI to help augment the antidepressant response or counteract the serotonergic side effect of nausea, anxiety, or insomnia. We also have the norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitors, and unlike other antidepressants, well, butrin or bupropion does not act on the serotonin system. It's a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor, and it also inhibits nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, to reduce the addictive action of nicotine, so they use this to help people stop smoking. And uh, it's prescribed in the name of Zyban or Brucopriam or Wellbutrin. Serotonin antagonist reuptake inhibitors. With these, uh, we're talking about trazodone is one. And high doses of this are required for the serotonergic action of the inhibitor. At lower doses, it loses the antidepressant action, but it still maintains those hypnotic effects through the histamine receptor antagonism action. So sometimes they might use this for sleep or for insomnia. The trazodone's potent adrenergic blocking properties can cause a painful, prolonged penile erection known as preaprism. So we do have to watch that. Also, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These block the presynaptic norepinephrine transporters, and they inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine. This makes the norepinephrine more available. The first truly selective noradrenergic reuptake inhibitor in the U.S. was atomoxetine or Stratera, and that's used to treat ADHD when a person can't tolerate those stimulants. 
It doesn't show a high benefit, though, for clients that have depression. Originally termed tricyclic antidepressants, these drugs are now called cyclic antidepressants because of the new four ring structure. Tricyclic antidepressants include drugs such as amitriptyline and nortriptyline, and they block the presynaptic transport of protein receptors, or norepinephrine, and they also slightly block those same receptors for serotonin. Blocking these receptors prevents the norepinephrine from coming into contact with that degrading enzyme. And so it increases the level of the norepinephrine at the synapse. Tricyclic antidepressants, again, will block the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. They're commonly known as dirty drugs because they can produce a wide variety of side effects, including anti-muscarinic, alpha-blocking, and antihistaminic side effects. They can cause cardiac arrhythmias, lower the seizure threshold, and some of these tricyclic antidepressants are associated with prolonged QT intervals that can lead to torsades. For example, to varying degrees, the TCAs block the muscarinic receptors that would bind to acetylcholine, and that causes anticholinergic effects. Can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't. Also, the TCAs block the H1 receptors, causing sedation and weight gain, so those histamine receptors. Strong binding at the adrenergic receptors lead to things like dizziness, and hypotension, increasing the risk of falls. Pharmacokinetics also have to be considered in tricyclic antidepressant overdose fatalities because the tricyclic antidepressants are highly lipid soluble and rapidly absorbed, which may result in cardiotoxicity and death before the client even reaches the hospital. If it's an older client, they're at even greater risk because of the slower rate of metabolism and excretion. Antidepressants have also been useful in treating different anxiety disorders, especially those that have shared symptoms, shared neurotransmitters. They're commonly used to treat things like panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and social phobia. Selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors such as venlafaxine and duloxetine are also used for generalized anxiety disorder. Other anti-anxiety meds include things like buspirone. Buspirone has the ability to reduce the client's anxiety without causing a sedative or a euphoric effect that is similar to that of the benzodiazepines. The nice thing about it is it doesn't have those addictive qualities and it doesn't cause that sedative effect. So the person can operate equipment, operate their motor vehicle. Uh, or as we say, drive the bus, as in bus road. They shouldn't use alcohol if they're on this medication, so you do want to treat, teach them about that. Benzodiazepines used to be one of the common used agents for anxiety, but due to people's high tolerance levels, um, abusive or addictive problems and there's a connection between the benzodiazepines and dementia so for those reasons they're now only be considered for short-term anxiety and we wouldn't give them 
concurrently with opioid medications if we can avoid it. So benzodiazepines, they increase the activity or stimulate the activity of something called GABA. And they do this by binding to the GABA receptors. And if we do this, um, then we can make more GABA available. And so this GABA will decrease the person's anxiety or reduce it. So the benzodiazepine has the ability to potentiate the GABA to reduce the excitement of the neurons. And it does this not only in someone that has anxiety, but it can also inhibit the actions of the neurons in someone that has a seizure disorder or in someone going through alcohol withdrawal. Now, one of the things that we typically watch for in this drug is respiratory depression, coma, things like that. However, we watch for that because it's a central nervous system depressant. So it's really more dangerous if we use it with things like alcohol, opiates, tricyclic antidepressants. Then those actions can lead to life-threatening respiratory depression. And any drug that would inhibit electrical activity in the brain also can interfere with the client's judgment and ability to operate things like a motor vehicle or anything that's, you know, controlled by a motor. So their reflexes and their attention is going to be impaired when they take this drug. And that's why they can't drive. They don't make legal decisions. In addition, ataxia is a common side effect when we have extra GABA receptors in the cerebellum. So if the GABA is more available, uh, they could have a little bit of ataxia with that. Short acting sedative hypnotic sleep agents or non benzodiazepine hypnotic agents like Ambien or Zolpidium uh, Sonata or Zalaplan and Esopiclon or Lunesta show selectivity for GABA receptors, especially those that contain A subunits. So they've been termed Z hypnotics and they have sedative effects without the anti anxiety, anti convulsant, or muscle relaxant effects of those benzodiazepines. We also have Ramelteon or Rosarem, and this is a melatonin receptor agonist. It's a hypnotic. It acts the same way as endogenous melatonin, meaning melatonin that's produced from within the body. It has a high selectivity at the melatonin 1 receptor site, and it's believed to regulate sleepiness at the melatonin 2 receptor site. All right, and that helps regulate the circadian rhythm. <clears throat> With lithium, it's not sure exactly how it works. However, it is known that it regulates neurotransmitters, especially dopamine, glutamate, and GABA transmission. It also acts at the intracellular level, inhibiting in, including inhibiting intracellular proteins, stabilizing the calcium channels, and decreasing neuron activity. It takes about three to six weeks before it starts to work completely. It has a low therapeutic index. So in order for the lithium to be most effective, we would want the levels to be somewhere between 0 0.6 and 1.0. If we're treating mania, 0 0.5 to 1.2.
toxic concentrations are greater than 1.5. And we draw them at trough levels 12 hours after the last dose. With older adults, we may have good symptom control with a lower level of the drug. Cases of severe toxicity would be levels of two or greater. That could indicate a life-threatening emergency. Symptoms of toxicity would be neurologically coarse tremors, slurred speech, ataxia, seizures, stupor, coma, GI disturbances like severe nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, cardiac disturbances like hypotension, bradycardia, EKG abnormalities, and kidney failure. In such cases, we might have to do gastric lavage, and um, that would hopefully help excrete the lithium. Hemodialysis could also be used in extreme cases. Long-term use would increase the risk for both uh, kidney disease and thyroid disease and diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Uh, clients need to drink lots of fluids with this and maintain a normal sodium level. Valproate or di valproic sodium, also known as Depakote, and valproic acid, known as Depakine, are also helpful in clients that have bipolar disorder, especially those that don't respond to lithium. It can help by in inhibiting the enzymes involved in the GABA breakdown and inhibiting the excitability of the neurons. There are black box warnings for the Depakote or the di divalproic sodium, and those include pancreatitis, hepatotoxicity, teratogenicity. And so if we're giving it to someone of childbearing age, we want to make sure that we talk to them about using effective birth control. The valproate also can increase the concentration of another mood stabilizer called lamotrigine. So if your client is on that, you want to consider that. Lamotrigin is effective in bipolar depression. It helps inhibit the release of glutamate and aspartate. However, it can trigger a severe skin reaction called Steven Johnson syndrome. We also use something called parbamazepine or Tegretol. It's not as effective as the lithium and it can cause more side effects than the valproate. It's very effective in rapid cycling bipolar disorder. It stops the neurons from becoming excitable or as excitable, especially in the acute manic phase. And it stabilizes the sodium channels in the neurons. A complete blood count has to be done before we start a client on this drug because they can develop a rare but serious blood dyscrasia, one of them being aplastic anemia and the other being a granulocytosis. Off-label mood stabilizers include trileptol or oxcarbazepine, gabapentin or neurotin, and topramate or topamex. Benzodiazepines can also be used during acute mania, and sometimes they can use antipsychotics, antidepressants, along with the mood stabilizer. A lot of times they'll give something like Geodon or something along those lines. You just have to remember if we're giving those drugs, we want to definitely do some cardiac testing first or make sure some's been done recently. Next, we're talking about antipsychotics. First generation antipsychotics were once called neuroleptics, and that's because of the neurological effects they display on the body. They're often referred to as dopamine receptor agonists because they bind to dopamine type 2 receptors 
and they reduce the dopamine transmission. D2 blockade helps the therapeutic effect of decreasing the positive symptoms in schizophrenia, but it can also cause extra pyramidal side effects such as dystonia or muscle stiffness, akathisia or restlessness, tardive dyskinesia, and drug-induced Parkinsonism. Anticholinergic agents such as cogentin or benztropine can be used to manage the drug-induced Parkinsonism, but anticholinergic therapy is often linked to confusion, memory problems, and dementia in the older adult. The D2 blockade may also lead to a life-threatening complication called neuromalignant syndrome involving autonomic motor and behavioral symptoms. If this occurs, the antipsychotic agent would be stopped immediately. Signs of neuromalignant syndrome include severe muscle rigidity, confusion, agitation, increased temperature, increased pulse, and increased blood pressure. In addition to adverse effects happening with this D2 blockade, other effects also can occur from those antipsychotics blocking other receptors. For example, these antipsychotics block the muscarinic cholinergic receptors, and that can cause blurred vision, dry mouth, constipation, and urinary hesitancy in the client. Antagonism of the H1 receptors or the histamine receptors leads to sedation and weight gain. And then because there's a blockage at the alpha-1 receptors for norepinephrine, the this will lead to vasodilation and the patient can experience a drop in blood pressure or orthostatic hypotension. Antagonism of either A1 receptors or the 5H2 HT2 receptors can also cause ejaculatory dysfunction. First generation antipsychotics are considered either high potency or low potency. And that indicates the drug's affinity for the D2 receptor, which in turn influences the adverse effects of the drug. High potency Haldol and Flufenazine or Prolixin have less sedation and fewer anticholinergic effects than the low potency Thorazine, chlor Chlorpromazine, and they cause more extra peridial symptoms. An acute dystonic reaction is more likely to occur early in treatment with a high potency neuroleptic, such as Haldol, especially if the client uses substances such as cocaine. So, as you can see in the illustration here, these first generation antipsychotics bind to the dopamine receptors, the type 2 dopamine receptors, to reduce the amount of available dopamine because there's too much dopamine usually in someone who has psychosis or schizophrenia. So we'll see extra pyramidal side effects and adverse actions, adverse reactions with these conventional antipsychotic drugs. So dystonia or that muscle stiffness, akathisia or that restlessness, tardive dyskinesia, drug-induced Parkinsonism, and the neuromalignant syndrome, which is rare but life-threatening. Again, with that, you'll have an elevated temperature, rigid muscles. Specific adverse effects from these drugs, again, would include blocking the muscarinic cholinergic receptors, leading to things like blurred vision, dry mouth, constipation, urinary he hesitancy, antagonism of those histamine receptors, causing sedation and weight gain, and blocking of the alpha-1 receptors for norepinephrine, which can lead to vasodilation, a decrease in the blood pressure, orthostatic hypotension, and then 
antagonism of either alpha-1 receptors or the 5-HTQ receptors, creating ejaculatory dysfunction in the body. Blocking muscarinic cholinergic receptors may result in which of the following? So we know it's not orthostatic hypertension because that would be the alpha receptors. Weight gain and sedation would be the histamine receptors. So then it's likely blood vision. Extra pyramidal side effects are the result of which of the following? Too few receptors, too little serotonin, dopamine blocking, or too much serotonin. As you notice, I read from the bottom up. That's how I like to read my answer choices. This way I don't leave one out, and then I go through each one. All right, so I don't believe it's too few receptors, and I don't believe it's too little serotonin. I do believe it's dopamine blocking because when we block dopamine, dopamine has to do with movement. And then I don't think it's too much serotonin, although I do sometimes look for opposite answers there. Let's see. Dopamine blocking. So now we're going to talk about second generation atypical antipsychotic drugs. And these are known as the serotonin dopamine antagonists because they target the serotonin 5-HT2 receptors and the dopamine T2 receptors. They're prescribed more often because they have less EPS uh, symptoms. So one thing that they discovered is when they started with the first generation antipsychotics is that they targeted the positive symptoms in schizophrenia, meaning they targeted the uh, hallucinations, the delusions, and the illusions. In schizophrenia, we also have negative symptoms, and those negative symptoms are things like lack of motivation, anhedonia. So they're things that normal people should not be without. So we shouldn't be without pleasure. We shouldn't feel depressed and down all the time. We shouldn't lack motivation. So these are the negative effects of schizophrenia. So the drugs would originally, the type 1, would target just those positive symptoms of the hallucinations, the illusions, and the um, delusions. They really made sometimes those negative symptoms of lack of motivation, of anhedonia, worse. So they thought if they could make something that would help target the serotonin, they could improve both the positive and the negative symptoms. So these drugs target the serotonin 5H2 5HT2 receptors and the dopamine T2 receptors. Because they do that, they have less effects, less less, less extra pyramidal side effects. These drugs include clozapine, olanzapine, risperdone, quidapine, ziprazidone, apripriazole, loperidone, lorazidone, and caryprazine. So on this slide, you could see the effects of the antipsychotics based on the areas that they block. So if they block the muscarinic cholinergic areas, then we would see dry mouth, blurred vision, urinary retention. If they um, block the dopaminergic or the D2, okay, we'll see extra pyramidal side effects. If they block the uh, histamine, we would see sedation and weight gain, orthostatic hypotension. If they block the 5-HT2 receptors, then we would see uh, weight gain, hypotension, ejaculatory dysfunction. If it blocks GABA, it would lower the, sex, the seizure threshold. If we block the alpha-2 receptors, we could have sexual dysfunction or the long-lasting erections with the preaprism. If we block the alpha-1 receptors, then we would see things like orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, 
And if we block the D2 receptors, in addition to the antipsychotic effects, the extra pyramidal symptoms, so these are your um, first generation, okay? You could also see an increase in prolactin levels le leading to gynomastia, um, hyperprolactinemia, galactorrhea, and amenorrhea. Now, when we look at the side effects of the typical versus the atypical in um, conventional or first-generation drugs, we're going to see more EPS. We'll see that dystonic. We're more likely to see that dystonic reaction, the akathisia or the restlessness, the drug-induced Parkinsonium, the tardive dyskinesia, which is really long-term effects now of that EPS and neuromalignant syndrome. And then with the atypical generation drugs, we'll see the risk of mes metabolic syndrome. So that'll be like your Respiradol, your Olanzapine. Uh, we're going to see increased blood sugars, especially with that Olanzapine. Uh, metabolic syndrome, increased weight, increased blood glucose, increased triglycerides, and insulin resistance. But we'll see a lower risk for the extra pyramidal symptoms. So when we talk about psychoneuroimmunology, what we're really talking about is the interaction between the body's immune system and the nervous system and how it relates to behavior and health. So scientifically, when we investigate at the molecular, the cellular, and the neuron uh, level, okay, we look at how different events are affected. Chronic inflammation in the body causes the release of something called cytokines and pro-inflammatory chemicals. And those cytokines can change the neuroplasticity and reduce the ability of the neurons to regenerate in the hippocampus. Or it reduces what we call neurogenesis. When that happens, the patient can experience a decrease in their cognitive skills, their ability to learn, and it causes changes. So the neuroimmunopharmacology really focuses on how drugs modulate the neuroimmune process and it's starting to explore highly advanced technologies uh, such as nanotechnology to develop approved nano drugs. Cross-cultural pharmacology explores different responses that occur among ethnic groups and reasons for those effects. It looks at variations that are influenced by genetic predisposition as well as cultural beliefs that surround men mental illness and pharmacotherapy. The client's perception of the need for treatment, adversion to certain side effects, and preference for alternative or complementary complementary therapies have to be considered. Genes are considered plastic because the dynamic pattern of gene regulation is a response to internal cues as well as external cues. Monitoring the effects of integrated methods of treatment and empowering patients to make informed decisions at the heart of psychiatric nursing. Genetics play which role in response to psychotropic drugs? Genetics are related to the disease process and not the drug response. Response to psychotropic drugs may be related to genetics. Genetics are not associated with the drug response. Different ethnic groups have different responses. And the answer was response to psychotropic drugs may be related to genetics. I would really take a close look at those neurotransmitters and those drugs and get to know them well. Have a good day. I look forward to YouTube and with you again. This concludes chapter four.